Honor uh, to talk about a species that we haven't uh, talked about yet. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, we are going to be talking about our lion tail macaque. Uh, the lion tail macaque is an old world monkey. So it is a monkey from India, so the Asiatic area. Uh, and it is one of our more critically endangered species that we have here at the zoo. Uh, we have two of them. And so I'm gonna try to plug in this other camera. Hang on just a sec here. Let me see if we can get this one up and running. Give me a moment. Looks like it froze on us. Okay, let's try this. Da, 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 da. Trying to use other technology today. Let's see if it's gonna work for us. Okay, doesn't look like it wants to connect. Hang on guys. Let me try to get my other camera going. Here we go. All right, so. All right, and Emily, you're gonna have to let me know with audio and everything about what's going on. So I'm gonna use and this you? little web camera. How's our audio, can you hear me? I can hear you pretty well. Okay, cool. All right, so again, we're up at our Conservation Learning Center. We're actually gonna be joined hopefully in a little bit by Julia, who is one of our zookeepers. And then uh, Dr. Roth is gonna be coming up also in just a moment uh, to help uh, talk about our two lion tail macaques. Um, so this is our female right here. And her name is Beanie. And you can tell Beanie from Haji. Haji is our male. Hang on, of course, we're moving to the side here. So we're gonna travel. Hold on guys, sorry about the camera here. Give me a moment. Always craziness going on at the zoo. Gotta love it. Got to love it. Woo! <laughs> Hopefully you guys all took some drama with me this morning. Um, all right, so let's see if we can get Haji. So there's Haji over there. Um, so Haji is our male lion tail macaque. We have two of them. And uh, Haji is upwards in his 30s and Beanie is upwards uh, in her 40s, I believe. But again, Julia is going to be uh, coming up and hanging out with us in just a little bit. Uh, so she's going to give us their exact birth dates. And as I said, the lion tail macaque is an old world monkey from uh, Asia and really only down in kind of the southwestern part of India. And there is a very few number of this species that's out there. They spend a lot of time up in the rainforest. Um, so sorry that they went over there. They were just sitting right here, of course. Um, so you have Beanie, who's through that tunnel right there. And then Haji, who is up on top sitting there. Um, and we used to have a troop of about six of these monkeys. And over the years, um, you know, age happens and the troop uh, um, has now only the two in there. But you can find lion tail macaques and troops upwards of 20 and 30. And again, it's a very arboreal species. So a species that loves to climb up in trees, as you can see right here. And um, with us here, we've decided not to bring in any more. Um, lion tail macaques, like all primates, humans as well, have the potential of carrying diseases. And one of the diseases that the lion tail macaques can carry is something called herpes B virus. And these two have never tested positive for herpes B virus, but one of the macaques that is no longer with us, um, she did test positive and therefore uh, now that entire troop is considered a herpes B positive troop, even though these two have not tested for it. And so bringing in other macaques um, would potentially, um, you know, lead them to be susceptible to that. Again, even though these two have never tested positive, they're still considered a herpes B positive um, uh, troop. And it's a disease that um, can kill lion tail macaques. Um, and uh, that's not what happened to the female that did test positive. She was just an older macaque that passed away. Um, but uh, again, since they are primates, they are susceptible to a lot of the same diseases and viruses that um, humans can get and also different ones. So the herpes B virus um, is not um, like the herpes virus that we would think of uh, for humans, but it is something that can be contracted and it is a blood disease. So um, it, it can create quite a bit of problems. So whenever we go in 
with any of our primates, we have what we call full PPE. Um, so that's our personal protective equipment. And this, at this time during COVID, uh, everyone should know what PPE is because we are all wearing it or should be wearing it whenever we're out and about. So um, we just have to wear our masks when we go out in the public right now to try to protect ourselves from the coronavirus and to decrease the spread. Uh, but when we go in with our lion tail macaques, we have uh, full goggles, full gloves, the uh, N95 mask, and potentially cover overalls if we're doing any sort of hosing and washing down. Um, and that again is to not only protect the monkeys, but also to protect us. Um, so we can have viruses that can be uh, contracted or spread to the lion tail macaques as well. Uh, we do know that COVID-19, the coronavirus, um, is one that can be transferable to animals and to humans. Um, and we call those zoonotic diseases. So those zoonotic diseases is a disease that is transferable between humans and animals. Um, and there's a lot of those that are out there and there are ones that we have to be very careful of. Um, now the most well-known one, of course, is, is COVID-19, um, but we also have rabies. And then there is several other viruses, even tuberculosis, um, that can be transferable from human to animal and animal to human. Um, so it's one that, you know, we always have to be aware of. And, you know, it, it's something, again, now that I think a lot of people are educated on um, with the pandemic that is currently going on. And everybody now knows what PPE is. So um, it's kind of uh, good to be able to use that in a real life function, um, especially here at the zoo. So as I said, these guys are uh, highly arboreal, so they like to climb up in trees and they are an omnivorous species. Although they're eating a lot more fruits and vegetables, um, they will go after uh, small mammals, uh, rodents, uh, they'll go after lizards, um, and of course they are gonna go after some insects as well. So, um, you know, and with two of them in here, they do really well with each other. Um, they, are, they are bonded, it's not a breeding pair. Um, but it's one that they do really enjoy uh, each other's company and do a lot of that social grooming that we would see. Macaques are highly territorial. Um, so once they establish an area, then that troop will defend that area against other uh, lion tail macaque troops. Um, and so hang on just a sec, because I think Julia is trying to come in. Oh, that's Cello there. Okay, Cello's got my other camera. Um, and so those, uh, those troops will definitely defend themselves. Um, and a lot of times what they'll do is vocalize. So they'll bark, they'll display, um, they will you know, throw up those manes that they have. And then of course, um, if that does not you know, tell the other troop to get away, then they will definitely attack. And these guys have some pretty powerful jaws, pretty powerful canines. Um, and uh, their bites can be fairly significant. So they are called the lion tail macaque, of course, because of that great mane that they have, that iconic lion mane, even though, of course, lions are from Africa. Um, but a long time ago, we did have lions in Asia as well. And so the lion tail macaque has that uh, beard. Um, both the males and the females have that, and then they have kind of a tuft on their tail. So um, we can see, oh, Venus is going to come up right here. Oh, hi, Beanie. So this ledge right here, I know it's a little bit dirty because um, this is where they like to hang out. Um, and, uh, okay, let's see if we can get a look at Beanie here. Oh, it's kind of uh, hard looking through. And also the sun is shining right in. The glare is kind of a little challenging. But this is definitely where they like to hang out during the morning time because it is much warmer. This is where they're gonna warm up. Um, so they'll sit here and kind of bask on this ledge and uh, try to warm up and use that mane um, to create a solar energy. So um, that may not only works as a display, but it also works because um, it will help, you know, absorb all that heat and help them to warm up. Cause these guys can live in cooler climates um, so they're well adapted to the cool weather, but then again, it's also tropical. So um, that rainforest can get warm as well. So they do really well, even in our summertime, of course they have coolers on them and air conditioners, and they're going to 
you know, use that to kind of cool up. Hi, Beanie. Beanie's looking at us. She's like, what is going on with this camera thing here? Um, <laughs> she's trying to say hi. Um, I'm trying to get you guys a good view here, but it's a little bit challenging. I do think Julia is coming up and she was going to bring some food for us. Uh, so give me just a sec here. I'm going to try and call Julia on the radio and just let her know where we are at. 91286. 86 downstairs, VLC, have your way. Check, we're in, uh, upstairs, VLC. Okay, with Julia coming up, um, em Emily, I think what I want to do is I want to switch cameras because Chill just brought my camera. So hang on just a sec, guys. We're going to kind of switch cameras back to me. Sounds good. All right. All right. Give me just a moment because I want to get our good camera going. Hang on. It'll be just a moment. I've got everything else set up for it. So. This camera will be much better. Hang with us, guys. Sorry, we're a little disorganized this morning, but hey, that's the zoo, man. That is how we roll here. We take things as they come and we roll with it. So we're gonna attach in here. All right, Emily, can you still hear me? Check, check, check. Testing, testing. Um, it does All say right. your bandwidth is low. Oh, no. Come on, bandwidth. Work with me here. That's because we just upgraded our camera. Um, so now we're pushing a real high signal. So you're going to have to tell me if it's fuzzy or not, uh, Emily. It's a little fuzzy, and it seems like it's a bit got a bit of lag. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can decrease our um, frames per second here. That might help us out. So let's see if that has anything to do. Is that helping at all? It's not changing. Okay, well, um, do we have a better view of uh, Haji here, at least? Uh, yeah, it looks it looks better. Okay, well, I guess we're just gonna kind of um, hang with it. Let me know. I'm gonna focus a little bit better on Haji here. Um, still fuzzy. How about now? Is that uh, I'm trying to focus a little bit better on him. Um, so hang on just a sec. Okay. All right, are we still getting a lag? Um, I feel like yes, but it's a little bit hard to tell since he's pretty. Still? Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully he um, hangs right did, there. It did take away your uh, bandwidth notice, so I think we're doing a little bit better. Okay, awesome. All right, very cool. And now we have Julia who's up here. Thank you, Julia, for coming up. Um, so, and Julia, we were just talking that we have Haji and Beanie, and, um, oh, Beanie's just coming right down here. Um, and Haji is 33? He is 29. 29. Is 33. And she is 33. Okay, so I was, I was close. Um, okay, so uh, Haji, and he just turned 29, right? Uh, he turned 29 in October, and Beanie turned 33 at the beginning of this month. 33 at the beginning of this month. Okay, very cool. Now, up here, we are in our, as I said, our Conservation Learning Center in our upstairs classroom. Uh, this is where we do some of our education programs. Uh, but when we built this and we wanted to build it with the lion tail macaques in mind and being able to do some feeding from up here. So we have some food shoots that are on our side here that we can actually drop some food down in. So uh, we were just talking about their diet, Julia, and saying that they are omnivorous. 
Um, but most of their diet is really fruits and vegetables. Um, but we have some special treats for them today that we're going to try to give them. So what do we have? Um, so I have some peanuts in shell for them. Uh, it's a really good source of protein and healthy fats for them, which is really important since they are geriatric. Um, they actually are um, needing to put on a little bit of weight. So uh, peanuts are a really great source of both of those things, um, and they absolutely love them. <laughs> okay, now these are unsalted peanuts, so they're not quite the peanuts that we're going to get. But um, so Julia is going to drop. I'll show you here what we're doing. Um, so Julia is on this side here. And Hi, we have Beanie. A little food chute that's right in the tree. And we can drop that yeah. right down in. And then the lights on the cats are going to get it over on that side. So you're going to see that in just a moment. Sorry, we got a little bit of glare from the window here. Um, but you'll see Beanie come right up. And you can see that she's mm -hmm. going to get those treats. Uh, right through there. So um, it's a great way to give some treats uh, through our training wall here. Um, and looks like Beanie is going to stuff as many of those <laughs> in her mouth as she can. Uh, Haji looks fairly content hanging out over <laughs> on the far side up on kind of our little uh, tunnel right there, if you will. So we've installed a bunch of climbing um apparatuses in here again as an arboreal animal they do like to be up in the tree canopy they will spend some time on the ground looks like kaji's finally figured out oh we got some food um maybe i'll come over and see now julia it's a typically a hierarchy that happens and the troops are made up of mostly females some males um, do you, who would you say is the dominant one here? Hachi's definitely a little more dominant. Um, back in the day when Beanie was uh, much younger, she was a more dominant macaque, but as she's gotten older, she's mellowed out and doesn't mind as much. And it's a little easier for Hachi to be dominant since he's about twice her size and twice her weight. Okay, so that's one of the ways that you're gonna tell the difference between Haji and Beanie is the size difference. Um, so as Julia said, uh, Haji is about twice the size. Um, and it looks like Haji is looking in there like, where are the peanuts? Um, they're not coming down the chute all the way. Someone <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're a little stuck in the tunnel here. Um, you know, of course we had to create it for safety in mind. So it's quite the tunnel that goes through there. And a lot of times what they'll do is stick their hands up and in there to be able to grab a hold of them. So he's looking up in there at <laughs> point. <laughs> um, so what's uh, some of the other uh, treats that we might feed these guys? Uh, some of their other favorite things are um, pistachios. They really like to be able to open the shells of things. Um, uh, brows of various types. So grapevine and xylasma and bottle tree are their three favorite types of brows. Um, and very rarely they'll get uh, some other kind of treats like uh, some lunch meat or some cheese which they also really enjoy, but we don't do too much of just to make sure that they are staying nice and healthy since those aren't really naturally occurring food items. Okay, now one of the things that is really interesting why I wanted to invite Julia and hopefully Dr. Roth up here um, in a little bit is to talk about Haji and Haji has diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and diabetes is a disease that um, can inflict humans, as we know, but also really any mammal um, and even birds can get diabetes. Um, and it's one that is treatable and manageable, um, but it's one that's a little bit challenging when you don't go in with an animal. Um, like our lion's animal cacks, we are protective contact with them, so we do not share the same space at the same time with them. We've talked about that with several of our powerful animals. Um, and these guys are a powerful species. As I said, they will defend themselves. They have very sharp teeth. And then we talked about that they can carry zoonotic diseases. Um, so as a safety precaution, not only for our monkeys, but also for our keepers, um, we do work protective contact. And so how do we manage Haji's diabetes here at the zoo? So Haji is really great and he has been diabetic for about two years now. Um, and during that time, he has been voluntarily participating in his healthcare. 
So um, for about a year and a half, he was receiving just oral medication to treat his diabetes. Um, and he would willingly take that uh, when it was mixed in with some goodies uh, that he really enjoyed, like sugar-free jam. So just make it a little sweeter and a little more rewarding to take that medicine. Um, but now he is actually receiving insulin. Um, his condition got a little bit worse. And so he needed uh, a little bit more uh, care for that. And so he receives uh, a long lasting insulin injection once a day. Um, and he voluntarily enters a space for that and then voluntarily allows us to kind of pull him closer towards us so that he can get that injection. We're currently working with him um, to have him be able to uh, put his shoulder or his hip up to the fence line for us to be able to voluntarily give that injection. But he knows every morning that that injection is coming and he um, readily participates in it. And it certainly has made an improvement in his attitude and overall his health care. And he is doing very well because of it. Now with diabetes, one of the things that we need to keep an eye on, of course, is his glucose, is his sugar. Um, and typically somebody, a human that has diabetes will do that through a glucometer and a blood stick. So mm -hmm. um, a little drop of blood uh, on a glucometer will let that individual know uh, what their insulin level is, what their blood glucose is, and then they can adjust their insulin according to that. Um, we're not doing gaining blood from him, but so how are we checking uh, his sugars? Um, so we're not doing blood just purely because of those zoonotic disease reasons. Um, and so we uh, collect urine samples from him as frequently as we possibly can. Um, and then we run uh, urinalysis tests on those to check for glucose, to check for ketones, all different types of things um, and let us know if we need to adjust the insulin level um, in any way. And so far that's been working really well. Um, and it just helps eliminate any kind of negative experience since he doesn't mind. He has to go to the bathroom anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. So the big question is then, how do you catch his urine? Is it just on the ground and you use a syringe and you're able to, you know, kind of suck it up and then we can do an analysis on it? Yep, that's typically how we get it. Um, we haven't taught him to uh, urinate on cue, which is something that a lot of animals are taught to be able to do. But for him, he pretty consistently goes to the bathroom first thing in the morning. Um, and so we're able to scoop that up uh, pretty quickly there and be able to run it and everything works out. Now, lion tail macaques, being an intelligent species as a primate species, um, they're able to understand several different cues. And, um, you know, we don't say commands because we don't command our animals to do anything. We basically will give them a cue to ask them to participate in their training. And that had to have come in handy when you're trying to just get him into a specific spot, um, mm -hmm. you know, to teach him that this is where you need him to be, um, to be able to receive that insulin. And I'm sure he does other behaviors as well that help you take a good look at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in order to get into the space that we need him to, he has a cue of shift, meaning just kind of move from one space to another. Um, and he gets rewarded with a high value item for that, such as banana or grape, something that has a little bit more sugar, we're okay with giving him right around the time that he's gonna get insulin. Um, and he is really great with that. He understands what we want. Um, and we've been very, very proud of him for uh, participating willingly and shifting over to receive his insulin injection because that's not a very positive experience. No one likes getting um, poked with a needle, but he readily does it every single morning. Um, and even on a really cold morning like this morning, he still readily came over from under the heaters and participated. Now, what was kind of the signs or symptoms that you first noticed that alerted you that something might be going on with him to even for us to look for uh, that he is diabetic? So we were always treating uh, the macaques as if they were pre-diabetic because Haji's mom, who lived here at the zoo, Thelma, um, she had diabetes. So we knew that he was predisposed to having diabetes. So we were monitoring him for things like behavior changes, attitude changes, and for us, the biggest indication um, was him dropping weight. So he voluntarily participates in being weighed. Right now, he gets weighed twice a week, so we can also use that to help manage his diabetes. 
Um, but at that time, he was getting weighed about twice a month, and we noticed a steady decline in not only his behavior, not really wanting to participate as much in things, not really interested in enrichment, but we saw that weight going down. And so um, he was immobilized, and we ran tests on him and checked everything out really thoroughly, and that's when we discovered that he definitely had diabetes, and so we were able to start managing it uh, a little more proactively. And immobilized, for those of you guys, um, I know we've talked about that, about that before, but that is going under anesthesia. Um, so when we immobilize one of our animals, um, that is an anesthetic event where we will give them medicine that will have them obviously go to sleep and make it safe for us to go in uh, with them. And then that's where we can run all those uh, external diagnostic work, uh, blood work and x-rays, ultrasound, do teeth cleaning, do full checks of them. Um, we try to not go under anesthesia unless we absolutely have to, because of course, anytime we do go under anesthesia, it, it can be risky no matter what the species is, whether it's humans, lion-tailed macaque, an elephant, whatever it is. Uh, but it is something that we have uh, an amazing veterinary team and a chief veterinarian that um, is able to really understand and work on those diagnostics to get a good picture about what's going on um, of our animals here at the zoo. And really that's why we see them live these long lives. Um, now we said that Haji had, was predisposed because his mom um, is a diabetic. We know that diabetes uh, is a genetic trait. Um, and so it's definitely one that you're keeping a very close eye on. How is he doing right now with his diabetes and managing it? Um, so he has been doing much better since we have started the insulin. On and off, we have seen some levels of ketones in um, his urine that we run those tests on. Um, but we've mostly been able to treat that by um, giving him lots of fluids to help flush out his system and increasing insulin as needed. So um, we have had a pretty good management system for him. And in the future, if needed, we can increase his insulin to twice a day. We could have him go back on that oral um, medication to help with the diabetes. And, and so we have a few other options, um, but for right now, he is doing fairly well. And the main thing we're just working on is um, having him voluntarily receive fully the injection, meaning he pushes his own body part up against the mesh to receive that injection. But that takes a little time because that is not a pleasant experience, no matter what the reward is for that. Yeah, it's still amazing to me that we're able to obtain behaviors um, that aren't necessarily that rewarding, but that the animals trust us enough, um, one, to feel safe, and then know that potentially we're trying to help them, um, but then also there's going to be another reinforcement for doing that. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like taking a child to the doctor to get a vaccine, them knowing that they're going to get an ice cream or something afterwards. Um, so they're like, all right, well, I'll do this um, as long as I get something good afterwards. Um, but, you know, for our animals here at the zoo, look, he's looking for more treats now. Um, he's like, is there, any, is there going to be any more coming out of this little uh, dispenser, this food dispenser here? Uh, what's going on? I, uh, they're really good at catching these peanuts as they come out too. It's impressive. Um, and then they do have uh, food pouches uh, in their mouth, so they will uh, shove as much in there as they can. Uh, now, Haji doesn't quite have to worry about any, you know, Beanie coming and taking his food. But uh, Beanie, as you saw when she first went in there, she kind of went and grabbed a whole bunch and then uh, shoved it in her mouth pouches and then kind of went, went away. Um, so let's talk a little bit about enrichment uh, and what some of their favorite enrichment might be. You said browse. So browse, again, is any sort of a edible plant that we have here at the zoo. We feed browse to a lot of the animals. We use browse as a lot of enrichment, um, but these guys, being as intelligent as they are, do need a lot of enrichment uh, to maintain kind of good mental capacity and that stimulation throughout the day. So what's some of their favorite enrichment that they like to get? Um, so we do quite a few puzzle feeders. So different ways that they have to manipulate objects and kind of figure out how to get food. Food is very, very motivating for them. And um, 
macaques in the wild would spend a very good portion of their day foraging and finding food. And so we like to make sure that they have that opportunity to take time to find food. Um, and so not only puzzle feeders, but also just large amounts of like hay or leaves or different substrates that they have to spend time really picking through to find the good things that they want to eat. Um, Cause that's a very natural behavior for them. And those cheek pouches are really helpful because as they're going around and foraging, they'll stuff those cheek pouches nice and full. Um, and then once they feel like their cheek pouches are full enough, they will head over to a safe higher up location where they can check out what food items they've grabbed and actually start eating them. Um, and their cheek pouches are really impressive as you were saying. Um, they can hold the same amount of food in their cheek pouches as they can in their stomach. So they will fill those to capacity and then they know that they're going to have a nice full belly after that. Now, do we feed these guys some insects? Do we ask, them, do we have them, you know, go and hunt and forge for insects? Absolutely. Uh, wax worms are their absolute favorite and that is an item that I use for training with Haji. Um, so when I'm working on those behaviors, such as voluntary injection, um, I use wax worms for that behavior. Um, but I also really like to put wax worms in more complicated puzzle feeders because it just encourages him to put in that extra effort and work a little harder to get to those worms. Um, whereas something not as valuable like maybe lettuce or spinach or collard greens, which eh, not as exciting, they won't work as hard for and they might just leave it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, now, one of the things when I told Julia that we were gonna be doing our lion tail macaques this morning at nine o'clock. Um, she was like, well, you know, they don't really like to get up in the morning um, and they don't necessarily like the cold. Um, so these guys, uh, you know, they, they do okay in, in the cold weather, but they don't really love it, right? No, these guys are um, rainforest animals. They live in the monsoon kind of areas in India. That's where they are found. Um, and so they're not really cold weather adapted. Both of these animals have lived here at Reed Park Zoo their entire life. So they are more used to this type of weather. Um, but they have a nice warm spaces in the back with bar heaters, with forced air heaters, so um, blankets. So they've got a really nice cozy setup in the back there, which I'm sure for a lot of us, it's hard to get up in the morning right now when it's so cold and same goes for them. But as long as it's nice and sunny, um, they seem a little more inclined to want to get up because they do really enjoy sunning and that's a really good natural behavior for them as well um, to warm themselves naturally in the sun. And again, that's why we've chosen this spot up here, even though we are getting a bit of a glare, you can see that um, this is where, you know, the, the lion tails during the early morning like to hang out. So for those of you guys that are coming during the morning, um, you know, this is the spot where you're going to kind of see them up here on this ledge hanging out and it's a pretty small ledge but man they don't care i mean they are super nimble super agile i mean they'll climb all over even the roof of this fence um so using that strength and that dexterity that they have to be able to really manipulate their environment um, and you know as we've said this is you know, they live in the rainforest so um it's one where they spend a lot of time way up in the canopies and are very agile um, in navigating higher elevations. Uh, so I don't know, Alexis might be tied up with um, our other project going on today. So I'm not sure if she's gonna be able to come up. I did want her to just to come up and talk a little bit more about diabetes. I mean, Julia has uh, such a great knowledge base of it working with Haji here um, and uh, has given us some great information um, but Emily, does anyone have any questions right now as we're going through that maybe we can help answer? Um, so we do have a couple of questions. One of them goes back to the herpes B. Um, you did say mm -hmm. it was a blood disease. Is that, how do they contract something like that? And is it preventable? Um, it's preventable by avoiding contact with other individuals. Um, and it's, um, it's a, it's a virus that, again, um, is, can be fairly common in this species. And so most likely it was contracted through another lion tail macaque. Again, we only had the one female test positive once um, and she didn't show any signs or symptoms and uh, we never had to treat it 
Uh, but once they do test positive once, then it's considered a herpes B positive troop. Um, and so because of that, you know, that's, that's gonna limit any other lion tail macaques that we bring in. Um, and the other thing too, is as I said, these guys are a critically endangered mammal. Um, and there's not a lot of lion tail macaques out there. And so um, one of the things when these two do pass away, um, I'm not sure if the zoo will be looking at a different primate species for this habitat. Um, or look to bring in more lion tails. So that's kind of yet to be seen, but um, you know, it's one that we do think about if we were to bring in some youngsters. Um, it's a species that can live obviously 30 years. Uh, and so long-term with this species is one that may be challenging for zoos to be able to manage because of the decrease in their numbers. Um, they're decreasing their numbers because of course of habitat loss. We talk about that a lot with our species, um, but uh, the increase in farming in agricultural activity going on in their native land makes it very challenging for these animals uh, to have the large enough home necessary to be able to thrive. Um, so that's one of the main reasons that these animals are critically endangered. Um, and you know, it is one of our most endangered species that we have here at the zoo. Uh, so it's great that we've been able to have them for as long as we have and to be able to tell their story. Um, but unfortunately, there is getting to a point where we may not be able to manage them because there's not enough of them. And that's decisions that the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, have to look at, well, where can we really focus our efforts to have the largest impact? Um, and what species may already be on their way to extinction. And no matter what we do, we're probably not gonna be able to save them. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great species to have, but I'm not sure if we will kind of maintain having lion tail macaques long-term. I'm not sure if that answers the herpes B virus question <laughs> since I kind of went off on a tangent there, but um, gave you a little bit more information. And now they're, now it's warming up. So now they're moving all over the place. So forking around. Uh, going a little bit off of what you just said, Jed, are there conservation efforts being made in India to help protect the species? You know, I am not familiar with any. I am sure there are. Um, I'm sure there, you know, because not only are, is that habitat necessary for this species, but several other species as well. And, you know, so it is important to protect those rainforests. Um, we know that, you know, there's an abundance of wildlife that utilizes uh, those habitats and that ecosystem. And, um, you know, so I'm sure there is, I'm not familiar with any specifically targeting lion tail macaques. Julia, do you know? For the most part, um, they tend to fall under a lot of those blanket uh, conservation efforts uh, kind of focused on their environment since there are so many species that live um, in that uh, critical kind of habitat that they call home. Um, and so for the most part, they fall under that blanket thing. They're actually one of the least studied primates as well. So um, that also kind of contributes to that. It's a little difficult to have conservation efforts specifically focused on them when there hasn't been able to be a lot of research on them in the first place. Yeah, it's a challenging area. Um, you know, India has its own challenges with its government. Uh, and then, you know, where they are is a pretty thick rainforest. It's a species that's up in the canopies. So they can be a very challenging primate to be able to study. Um, and, you know, this zoo has had lion tail macaques for decades now. Um, so we are one of the only zoos. I'm not sure how many zoos have lion tail macaques. Do you know, Julia? Very few. I know our, the closest zoo that would have them is the San Diego Zoo, and they also have an elderly troop of macaques. So yeah. um, they're one of those species that are kind of getting phased out of zoos because of uh, the naturally uh, carrying herpes B for many individuals um, and just being a species, I guess, as you said, that's critically endangered and uh, might not be um, an ideal candidate for a lot of conservation efforts from zoos. Now they're moving all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we were able to get our other camera 
um, cause at least we can see them a little bit better here, but, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty active species. I mean, these guys kind of will move around quite a bit foraging in the morning. And then I'm sure at some point they kind of hunker down and take a little bit of an afternoon nap. Yeah. One of the enrichment things that we do for them is we change out those logs and that perching and really rearrange their habitat as best we can. Um, so that way, as they move around, they have to use, uh, more hunching or climbing or crouching and kind of use their bodies in different ways like they naturally would um, in those rainforest dense kind of areas. Um, and it just keeps their habitat a little more interesting to have it changed up on them. So we just recently changed up their perching. So they're still kind of figuring out their favorite pathways through everything. And we try and change it up um, every couple of months. Um, once we kind of see them using the same pathways really routinely, we like to mix it up on them. Very cool. Emily, do we have any other questions? We do have a couple more. Um, one is about Haji and sort of his shoulder back area. Um, is that normal? Does he have a little bit of a bald spot there? He does have a bald spot on his back. He has a little bit of hair loss there. Um, about a decade ago, uh, they had heaters that were a little far down. Um, and so the, the hair on their back there, um, stopped growing quite as well. Um, but we haven't had any problems since. It just hasn't really grown back in that area. Just an old man losing his hair. Yep. <laughs> I know how that goes. <laughs> um, let's see, one other one. Do they hunt or stalk their prey and do they cooperate in hunting? That's a really good question. Um, so they will hunt and stalk prey here at the zoo. They have caught uh, squirrels and sparrows and other wildlife that has had the misfortune of making its way into their habitat. They don't do it as much now that they're elderly. Um, they prefer to have the food given to them a little bit more. Um, but in the wild, they don't tend to do a whole lot of hunting. Um, and so cooperative hunting isn't something that's seen very frequently with them, um, just simply because uh, they would be a little more opportunistic with what they would catch. So it'd be smaller items that they would be able to get themselves. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting about them is they share habitat with um, some very large squirrels um, in India that are almost the same size as Beanie would be. Um, and they will actually follow those squirrels to find the ripest jackfruit. And then they will kind of shoo the squirrels away by smacking them on the head to get them to leave. And then they'll steal the fruit from them. So more than anything, they tend to use other animals as a method of finding more appropriate food items for them. So again, showing how intelligent they are, they figured out to uh, have the squirrels find their food rather than them. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool to be able to, to learn. So, um, all right, do we have any other questions, Emily? No, I think that uh, covered all of them. Um, so thank all right, you, well, we've Julia got, and uh, Yeah, we've got uh, Dr. Roth who actually just oh, joined good. us. So I want to chat with her just for a moment. Um, and uh, so introducing our chief veterinarian, Dr. Roth here. Um, thank you for joining us. I know we were busy this morning, but um, you're able to come up just for a couple minutes at the end here. And uh, Dr. Roth, we were talking about Haji and diabetes. And is diabetes common in this species? Yeah, you know, primates are primates. So just like humans, um, these macaques, as well as many other of both small and large primates, get diabetes. And uh, we were talking with Julie about how we first noticed that Haji was starting to show signs. And of course, we know that his mother um, had it, so we were keeping an eye on it, but it was really his change in behavior that alerted us that something might be going on. Yeah, so, uh, you know, our keepers are really attuned to everything that these animals do on a, you know, day in, day out basis. And so we started noticing some subtle changes in some of his behaviors, such as drinking a little more water, perhaps urinating more, or even just um, changing the way that he interacted with um, his keepers or the exhibit. And so once we start getting reports of that boy, we start looking a little closer and we did some blood work on him that was diagnostic for diabetes. And uh, Julia was saying that we were able to manage that with oral meds. Um, and then we kind of progressed a little bit more now to having to do an insulin shot. 
Yeah, so he was managed um, for quite some time, over a year, uh, with oral hypoglycemics, meaning medications that are designed to reduce his blood sugar. But eventually, um, those medications were just not strong enough, and we had to transition him to insulin injections, which are the same uh, medications that humans receive. And long prog prognosis with uh, maintaining him on those injections is pretty good? Yeah, he's doing great behaviorally. He's very accepting of his injections. He gets rewarded for participating um, in that injection every morning. So diabetes is not a curable disease generally with this species, but we've made some dietary adjustments um, and we're able to uh, do the best we can for as long as we can. And his quality of life is excellent right now. He's, he's essentially a normal macaque. And if we weren't managing this, if we didn't do anything, he would probably have succumbed to the disease. Yes, he would have succumbed to this disease uh, several years ago. So um, it's no small feat managing diabetes in any species. Um, the keepers are really doing a great job. Well, it is uh, amazing to hear again about the training that has gone into this, um, the diagnostic work that has gone into this, and um, it has basically saved his life. And he's now doing really well. And, you know, one of our older macaques and you know, can live a, a good, healthy, long life here uh, at the zoo. Exactly. Yep. All right. So Emily, do we have any other questions now that Dr. Roth just joined us? Um, I haven't seen any come in yet. Okay. All right. Very cool, guys. Well, again, I just want to uh, thank you guys for joining us this morning for our Lion Tail Macaque Wild Wednesday member virtual chat. Uh, sorry, again, we were a little bit late because um, we were doing another exciting project that we are going to be talking about next week. So don't you guys worry, you guys are gonna learn all about it. So you better tune in next week for next Wednesday's virtual chat. As always, thank you guys for everything that you do for being our Zoo members, for tuning in, for learning something new. Remember that we do have Zoo Lights going on every night um, up until Christmas, I believe we take Christmas off. Um, and then there's some bonus nights after Christmas. So um, if you're interested in coming, please go online, reparkzoo.org. You can get your tickets there. You do have to get tickets online before you come. Um, so make sure if you want to come to Zoo Lights, uh, you get your tickets now because they are selling out. Uh, so again, thank you guys for joining us. And we will see you all next Wednesday.